I, I do understand that, uh, you know, the, the topic, the primary topic is on AI and ML and so on, but then, uh, you know, quantum computing and quantum communications, uh, these are the two topics I wanted to discuss today. And I actually realized that, you know, we have started to use uh, uh, machine learning uh, approaches even in these domains. And so uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that as we go along as well. So with that, I would like to share my screen. And then, of course, as always, you have to confirm that you can see it. Um, and uh, yes, now would be a good time. Yeah. Okay, great. So let me just make this a bit smaller. Yeah. So, um, right. So what I wanted to talk to you about in the next half an hour or so is uh, quantum technologies, uh, specifically quantum computing and secure quantum communications. And these are the two areas that uh, my lab is working on and wanted to give you a little overview of the kind of things we do. And also a little bit about uh, how uh, perhaps uh, the topic of the, the main topic of the discussion may fit in uh, to this. Uh, so as mentioned, I'm Urbashi Sinha. I'm a professor at the Raman Research Institute in Bangalore. Uh, and I'm also an affiliate faculty at IQC and CQIQC, both in Canada. So, uh, right. So this is, um, you know, the Raman Research Institute. And of course, uh, it is a very interesting time because we have an online symposium and I've been doing that now for the last few months. But when uh, times are better, then please feel free to visit our lab uh, and, uh, you know, we can discuss more. Our lab is a quantum optics lab, which is also a class 10,000 clean room, which means essentially that we have less than 10,000 dust particles per cubic foot. And that is important because we work a lot on interferometry based experiments, which actually require a certain level of uh, precision. And then dust particles are great interferometers. And so we don't want those interferences in our, uh, you know, uh, experimental results. And so that is why uh, we have a clean room environment and we work on different areas. And this is a snapshot of various experiments experiments and so it's an optics lab and so you can see lots of optical components here and uh, the, we are, you know please feel free to visit the website for a lot more detail than I can provide in the next half an hour and so the topics as I mentioned are quantum communication computing quantum optics and fundamentals of quantum mechanics as well uh, these are the various people who are there and then of course people who have come and gone and you know making a vibrant uh, environment so going back to a little bit about the quantum mechanics itself, because I thought I'd spend a few minutes on, on discussing that and where all this fits in, you know. Uh, what is very interesting is that, you know, our theoretical understanding of the universe is very incomplete and we don't understand more than 80% of what the universe is made of. And so, you know, we talk about dark matter, dark energy and so on. And so then it's obvious that we also need to have a little bit of a skeptical attitude towards the various laws uh, which, uh, you know, uh, physical laws and so on, which we shouldn't be taking for granted because even a tiny modification to these would have deep implications, for instance, let's say on cosmology. And so fundamental tests of these various principles are very important because they give you bounds which then you can base your applications on. And so one of our primary areas of focus is fundamental tests, tests, precision tests of various principles of quantum mechanics. And then with those bounds, we can hope to, uh, you know, have uh, more precise applications in quantum computing and communications, uh, which are the two application areas. So quantum computing is, of course, as you know, a very important research direction. And they are, com quantum computers are projected to be able to solve certain problems for which there is no efficient classical algorithm. But actually, more importantly, it will be able to solve class of problems which will be exponential faster than what is possible in classical computation. And these are the problems which we are currently aware of, actually. And so that is what will make this revolutionary, because something which we thought perhaps is uh, going to take the age of the universe to solve will now be done in minutes or hours, depending on the power of the quantum computer. Uh, comes hand in hand what is called quantum cryptography, which actually secures, uh, gives you perfectly secure communication. And I will tell you a little bit about how these are the yin and the yang of quantum technologies, how they go hand in hand, how they should be developed together. And that is what we are focusing on. Now, going back to a little bit, you know, the next few slides, a little bit about the history of this subject. And of course, Richard Feynman cannot be avoided here. Richard Feynman is one of the most uh, famous physicists of all times. And very famously, he has said that I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. And this was 1965. But in 2020, we can say that nobody completely understands quantum mechanics. We do understand a little bit more in the last 55 years, but there's a lot more to learn. And that is what makes this so interesting and exciting. And, and, and you know, every step there is 
possible surprise and which requires a completely new explanation. And so that is what keeps this field uh, very vibrant. And of course, the topic of this uh, entire discussion session is about whether the AI will ever win a Nobel Prize. And having said that, we will see how there are so many applications which are there in our world around us, which are inherently dependent on quantum mechanics, very, um, you know, commonplace to very sophisticated ones. And essentially, quantum mechanics is one of those theories, which has had so many seminal discoveries associated with it, that indeed, it has led to Nobel Prize winning uh, discoveries, um, very, very periodically, and I mean, very regularly. And so we have, you know, so many people, so many great physicists and scientists who have been awarded the Nobel Prize in uh, physics for quantum mechanics discoveries, whether it's Planck, Einstein, uh, Bohr, De Broglie, and, and, and so many people. So, uh, I mean, you know, so these are all people who have made seminal contributions and gone on to win the Nobel Prize. But having said all that, you know, I, I agree with the, with, with the gentleman who introduced me just now and in the sense that, you know, uh, still, what is quantum mechanics? And I mean, you know, having said all this, there's always going to be this thing that we understand some of it, but not really all of it. But then if we still want to have some kind of an operational understanding, I would actually go back to this uh, formula here, which says this is something called the de Broglie wavelength, which tells you that, the, that every particle, whether it's a, a, you know, a matter particle or a light particle, uh, is associated with a certain wavelength, which is inversely proportional to its mass times velocity. So now when this wavelength becomes comparable uh, to the size of the particle, then, you know, the quantum effects start kicking in. So for instance, if I were to go and bang myself, you know, go and hit the wall, uh, I will perhaps just end up getting a little injured, you know, or very injured, depending on how fast I went. But if an electron does that, there's a finite probability that it will tunnel through. And so that is happening because these quantum effects, quant tunneling is a quantum phenomena, it's actually kicking in uh, at that uh, very small uh, size level. And so this is one way of kind of understanding a little bit as to where uh, the classical quantum boundary may be, but still it's an open problem. And, and uh, you know, we don't really have the perfect answer to it. But having said that, uh, this double slit experiment, which was voted you know, which is a very celebrated experiment in quantum mechanics, was voted the most beautiful experiment in physics uh, by a poll in the New York Times, goes on to say that, you know, uh, uh, there is a lot of mystery associated with this subject, but then there is a lot that one can learn from it and apply, which is what we want to go on to see next as to the strangeness of the quantum world, as we say in colloquial language, that actually gives rise to the power of the quantum world. So for instance, an important phenomena is what is called the quantum superposition principle. And that is what gives rise to what we call the quantum computer, which you know is very much in the news these days, because there are not only lots of research activities going on towards making these quantum computers, but also many companies have taken interest and, uh, uh, and you know, made a lot of headway towards making the larger qubit machines. And so this is not science fiction anymore. 10 years ago, when I kind of set up my lab, it was like, you know, is this ever going to happen? And now we are actually onto a national mission in quantum technology and applications in India. And I'm one of the uh, members of the drafting committee. And we see that this will happen very much uh, in the near future. And so having said that, what is the superposition principle? So uh, to explain this, you know, let us think about uh, what, what is happening around us in our, uh, you know, uh, silicon based uh, electronics. And so we talk about the transistor and the transistor can have an off state and an on state. And we can associate the off state with say, let's say the zero uh, and the on state with the one. So this is the classical bits, right? So that is what it's based on. So the binary digit or bit, so zero and the one, the off and the on state. But now when we come to a quantum uh, system, we talk about what is called a quantum bit or a qubit, which not only allows zero and one, but also allows states which have a little bit of zero and a little bit of one, which is what is called the alpha zero plus beta one state, let's say, where alpha and beta are complex amplitudes uh, following certain uh, rules, mod alpha square plus mod beta square is one. But then having said that, now that actually defines, uh, you know, the surface of a sphere. So essentially, we can occupy, this qubit can occupy uh, different surf uh, points on this surface, in principle, an infinite number of possibilities. Uh, with the normalization condition. So in some sense, this is what gives rise to this infinite dimensional um, space that we talk about. And so if you think about it here, you know, if I have a single qubit, uh, then of course, I just have two states, let's say zero and one, even in quantum, it's the same. So not much that you can gain from between the classical and the quantum. But now if I go on to two, 
So if I have two spins, let's say up and down, right? So two spins, then in the classical system, I would have one of these four possibilities, both zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, one. But in the quantum, I would actually have access to two to the power two or a four dimensional state space. So I would essentially have access to all four. So you can have, you know, all four possibilities happening at the same time. And so in some sense, if I go to 50 now, I would have, you know, uh, these are the possibilities, right? So there would be one in uh, these many uh, in the classical case, whereas in the quantum, I would have access to a two to the 50 dimensional state space. And that is what uh, gives rise to this power. So then when my um, quantum bit or, or uh, you know, a system of quantum bits is actually undergoing, uh, going through these quantum algorithms, which is a series of gates, right? And so when it's going through these uh, quantum algorithm, I'm making use of this fact that it can actually occupy this two to the n space, okay? And that is what makes this faster and gives rise to this speed up that makes a quantum computer uh, way faster than the classical one and this exponential speed up. And then of course, ultimately it is measured and then th that is gone. But then having said that, it is during the algorithm that we have access to the space, which gives rise to this uh, speed up in quantum computers. And there are lots of devices which are in contention for the quantum uh, computing. We can have solid state devices, you know, the spin of an electron up and down. And then of course, what I work on is uh, photons. So then I can talk about the uh, you know, the photonic uh, systems where I can have, let's say, polarization degree of freedom, uh, giving the horizontal and the vertical uh, and H alpha H plus beta V is my qubit. Again, you know, uh, these two gentlemen won the Nobel Prize a few years ago for their discoveries in um, photonics as well as um, trapped uh, ions. Okay. Uh, so going on to a little bit, I'll, I'll, I'll speak for the next three or four minutes on what we are doing in quantum computing. And then I will go on to quantum communication, which would be the next topic. So in quantum computing, as I mentioned, we are working with photons. Our lab is working with the photon, which is a single particle of light. So as you may appreciate, if you have to deal with um, a quantum system, you need to go down to the single particle level in order to manipulate it and, and make it uh, behave as a computer or a, you know, um, a, a communication device. But you need to go to the single particle level. And so there are different ways in which you can do this. And it's not as simple as just dimming down your light, you know, yeah, the statistics needs to be of a single particle. And so then this is a review article that I have uh, written along with my students, which uh, you can have a look to see what are the different ways in which you can make these single photon sources, uh, because there are dedicated means of doing that. And what we are working on in the lab is using nonlinear optics, and what is called spontaneous parametric down conversion. And so having said that, what do we do with these photons towards the quantum quantum computer. <laughs> so what we have decided is actually we are working on something uh, uh, some, somewhat unconventional and, and not quite working on qubit based quantum computers at all. So qubit based systems are very much available and you know, and there's a lot of research going on in that. But having said that, if you remember what I was talking about is this importance of this number two to the 50, right? So what is important here is this uh, fact that we need 50 qubits in coherent superposition. And that is in fact what gives rise to what is called the quantum supremacy. So beyond that, uh, we actually see the advantage kicking in in these quantum systems over the classical counterparts. Now, one way to do it would be to actually keep on increasing this number. And of course, uh, there have been, you know, we have been working on quantum computers and towards them for several decades now. But it's only very recently as of last year, we reached this supremacy uh, from Google. Right. So why is that? That is because it's quite difficult to put uh, these, uh, you know, large number of qubits in a coherent superposition. Uh, it's almost like putting a large number of people in the room uh, beyond a certain number, you would start getting into each other's territory. Right. And so something similar happens for the quantum system as well. You get into each other's space and this leads to what is called decoherence which is what we want to avoid. That leads to errors and that leads to uh, loss of coherence. And finally, the computation won't happen. And so one alternative way of doing this would be instead of using uh, you know, two as your base, if I increase this number to three, four, and so on, then the exponent drops. So two to the 50 is similar to three to the 33, for instance, and then four to the some number less than 33. So by using a smaller number of systems, I can actually have access to a similar complexity of a state space. And that is what gives rise to what is called higher dimensional quantum computing. And what we have in our lab 
uh, is you know a, a system uh, which we have developed ourselves using photons and and some techniques in down conversion which i won't get into where we have uh, what is called spatial cutrits and so we already have two cutrits in the lab which are nearly maximally entangled as well and we are poised towards you know uh, making uh, you know working on uh, both uh, computing applications as well as uh, communication applications using these higher dimensional systems again an overview of this can be found in this article in scientific american that i was invited to write where i've given a perspective on this higher dimensional uh, quantum computing that we are working on in our lab now uh, why is it interesting and of course you know a common example that i tend to give in a uh, uh, you know uh, in a general talk is uh, for instance you know if i have uh, to declare the results of let's say uh, a football game or something and so now um, what are the usual results let's you know win uh, a loss maybe a draw and or maybe a rain abandoned i am not the biggest expert on football but i'm thinking these are all four possibilities that are possible right so if i want to declare them using a quantum system uh, i can't do it with one qubit right because like one qubit has two states so only two results could be declared using that so i would need two qubits to do that but then if i use what is called a q quad which is a four dimensional system then i can only do that using one of them and that is the idea of a smaller number and higher a dimension which is what we are exploiting of course using our you know this is a, a schematic of our experiment i'll uh, skip that so this is how it looks in the lab okay uh, lots of optics and uh, and so this is our higher dimensional uh, quantum system so it's a bipartite two two qubit system and uh, these are various things which we have done uh, towards exploiting their entanglement finding new measures for them and also working on preliminary gates for quantum computing and we are now working on in you know, a higher uh, number of gates and we will do a protocol shortly and similarly in qkd okay so now going on to the next topic which is secure quantum communication using quantum key distribution so now why you should be worried about this why 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 should you care about this particular topic well not just because it is quantum but it is actually something which affects all of us really and now think about it quantum computer is something which perhaps i mean maybe i will be using it a little bit because i will be perhaps involved in developing it but uh, you know normal circumstances we won't see ourselves using it for daily life uh, tomorrow but the kind of things which i have listed here whether it's purchasing something using a credit card or online banking or or you know voting things like that or even defense communication which we may not do ourselves but our defense services are doing these are all examples of communication which we are directly or indirectly involved in and what is common between them is that these are all means of strategic communication right like if i am giving my credit card details i only want the person or the organization that i'm giving this detail to Uh, to know that i don't want a third person to come and get it for obvious reasons so these are things in which security in communication is important and currently what we are doing it uh, what doing uh, is actually working on what is called classical cryptography so as you uh, may know so the idea is these are all means of communication which perhaps do not require any security uh, you know it's it's fine but then if you want to have security then what we do is we have the message we encrypt it using what is called a key and then of course uh, the receiver also has the key and he or she can decrypt it and this is an example of uh, uh, this cryptography which is a vernam cipher or a one time pad as was used in the world war right and there are different types we have private key key you know the enigma machine is a popular is a very well known one and then there is the public key now but what is the problem with all this is that for instance this public key crypto uh, which is based on uh, a very popular rsa algorithm is actually going to be compromised with the advent of quantum computers and so now you see when i said in the beginning that quantum computing and quantum communication are kind of the yin and the yang of quantum technologies because quantum computing does promise to revolutionize many different as many different types of problem solving however it will also be able to solve a problem we don't want it to solve which is the which is will break the security of uh, our uh, classical crypto uh, based on public key for instance the rsa and so that is the thing and how does rsa work i mean this is a an example uh, you know a toy uh, model so essentially the situation that you see on the left is something that we are all very capable of creating very very quickly a bundle of uh, clothes on the floor right but the situation on the right is something we are also capable of creating but then uh, with much more time right so this these two you know uh, types of tasks are differ differ from each other uh, by the kind of time that it takes to uh, perform them
right? And so similarly, we have multiplication and factorization. So if I tell you what is three times seven, you'll give 21 as an answer at the bat of an eye. But then if I tell you what, is, what are the two prime factors of one, one, two, three, six, one, uh, that won't come so quickly. And so that is why there are certain classes of problems which are harder than others. Uh, and, and it is proportional to the kind of time it takes. And, and so this is a, uh, just a toy example. Uh, and so RSA algorithm is actually based on factorization uh, being a hard problem. Uh, mathematical complexity of factoring large numbers. Now Shor, uh, Peter Shor uh, is the person pictured here. He came up with an algorithm which will use quantum gates and can perform factorization in polynomial time. And so then uh, something which was a very hard problem, which is making things secure for us right now, as soon as Shor's algorithm starts running on a quantum computer, uh, it won't be secure anymore. So unconditional security is not possible using classical cryptography. And why, what are the problems? The problems are that computational resources grow very fast. And today's hard problem could be solved tomorrow using brute force attack. Okay. Similarly, new algorithms can come for classical computers. I mean, you know, because there is no law which tells you that uh, these are hard problems. It is just by design that we have not even not found a solution to it. But someone could. Then, of course, there's the realization of quantum computers, which is what uh, we were discussing, which will run the Shor's algorithm and, and, and break this hardness uh, of this particular class of problems. My security should be independent of future advancements in computational power new algorithms or new technology. That is, it should be future secure. And so this brings forth the need of quantum cryptography, where security is based on laws of nature or laws of physics and not on the mathematical complexity of a problem. And so the most important part in quantum cryptography is the quantum key distribution. So essentially quantum cryptography, the encryption and the decryption part are pretty much the same as what is done in classical. But it is the key distribution which is made secure using laws of quantum mechanics. So the threat that a quantum computer can pose is now mitigated by using quantum mechanics itself as a solution. And, and, and so that is, the, uh, that is why we need to develop quantum key distribution or quantum cryptography. And now someone may ask, you know, so this is uh, something that I always like to say that, you know, having said all this, this currently we are talking about the 2048-bit RSA key length and the security claim is that it is secure till 2030. But then having said that, um, I mean, and, and on a classical computer, it would take 1 billion years. Uh, this RSA 2048 challenge problem is what Krista has said very famously from Microsoft research. And a quantum computer could do it in 100 seconds. But having said that, you should realize that, you know, in order to make this happen, uh, it is estimated that we would need a quantum computer comprising 4,000 qubits and 100 million gates. And this is something we don't yet have. Okay, so we are working with, you know, a smaller number of qubits now and a smaller number of gates. But that doesn't mean that we should get complacent because, of course, uh, the rate at which the qubits are getting added to systems and, the, and, you know, the gates are getting added is definitely not linear. It is following its own curve, which is very, very fast and lots of effort going into it. So it's going to happen sooner rather than later. So we don't want to wait till then to be able to find the solution. Uh, so it's best to work on it from now so that the problem doesn't remain a problem by the time it appears in five to ten years time. And so that is why quantum key distribution becomes a very important area of research. So how does quantum mechanics protect information? I won't get into the details here, but there are various principles of quantum mechanics. For instance, the uncertainty principle, no cloning theorem, as well as correlations like quantum entanglement, which actually uh, protect uh, the information from through various means, which we won't get into. But essentially, uh, uh, the, we would know as soon as there is eavesdropping, thanks to these various principles of quantum mechanics, which our physical system needs to uh, follow. So now, why do we need entanglement in uh, QKD or quantum key distribution? Because, you know, there are ways of doing this without entanglement. Entanglement is needed. It's a quantum correlation. It's needed because uh, if we want to reach that next level of quantum key distribution, where we don't even trust our devices. At the moment, you know, we, we can work with devices where we are producing these bits and, and, you know, measuring and so on and so forth. But if the device itself becomes untrustworthy, thanks to, let's say, the manufacturer being uh, biased, then we need to go towards what is called device independent quantum key distribution. And for that, the only known method is entanglement based quantum key distribution. And that is why uh, entangle entanglement is necessary in QKD. Okay. So I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about the kind of experiments we are doing uh, on quantum communication now at our lab uh, in RRI. 
Okay, so we uh, there are different approaches to quantum key distribution. They could be prepare and measure based approaches. So you perhaps all heard of the BB84 protocol. This is the first protocol for QKD, which was in, uh, in you know uh, discovered in BB8 in 80 sorry BB in 1984. And in fact, it was declared in a conference in Bangalore itself. So it has a great Bangalore connection. And the B92 is a modification of the BB84, uh, which of course I mean you know, we tend to name our protocols according to the years in which they were developed. So it's 1990. And so these are methods of doing quantum key distribution without entanglement. So they actually rely on uncertainty principle for their security. Whereas if you use entanglement based security, then the popular ones would be the Eckert 91 and the BBN 92. Okay. And so prepare and measure, as I mentioned, they, uh, they are based uh, using uncertainty principle and won't get into the details for this audience. But then having said that, the BB84 is something we've done, uh, you know, around three, four years back. And, and recently what we've done is what is called the B92, but a modified version of this. And, and so this is something which uh, I, won't, I will not go into the details of how it is done, but it suffices to know that in this, instead of using four states as we do in BB84, we can use only two. And we have actually taken some new uh, methods, uh, uh, employed some new methods to increase the security and also increase the key rate of our protocol. Okay, and so this is how the uh, stuff looks in the lab. So, you know, Alice set up, Bob set up, and then they're communicating with each other. And if anyone uh, is interested in details of our experiment and so on, do have a look at this, um, uh, you know, uh, publication, which actually has a lot of detail regarding this. And so this is schematics, I'll skip the schematics. But what is important is that we have a key rate of 50 kilobits per second and a quantum bit error rate, which is a, a quantifier of how error prone your uh, communication would be is 4.79%. And this is a very important number because for every quantum key distribution protocol, one can come up with a threshold below which uh, it is uh, the errors are allowed and above which you just discard the protocol. And so the, below that, the errors could come from uh, normal experimental errors or from eavesdropping. But then it is still going to be secure because this is a good candidate for distilling a secure key. But above that, you cannot uh, work uh, with these errors, you see. So then uh, we have actually done, uh, taken a lot of, you know, um, pins to ensure that we have a cuber uh, less than 4.8%. And so in fact, that is very nice because you know, our uh, key rate and cuber are much better than the, uh, you know, the best available currently so far, uh, using a similar uh, as a spontaneous parametric down conversion based setup. And so our key rate is higher and the cuber is lower uh, than these uh, numbers which existed earlier, which is of course good because then we can use it for um, actual security purposes. And of course, we have done the image encryption. So ultimately, when you get the key, you would encrypt a message with it, and then Bob would decrypt the message. And so this is what we ended up getting. So this was our intended message. It was a picture of a cat. Um, uh, and then Bob decrypted the same thing. And you can see that they're pretty, they're, they're the same. Uh, and that is because, you know, we managed to get a very good uh, error free key. But then and this is what happens in between this garbage that you see in the middle uh, is uh, what the eavesdropper would see. Okay, and if we didn't do a good job, we might end up with a completely different picture. This was my student's idea of animation. So, um, and then for entanglement based protocols also we have done, uh, you know, polarization and I will skip the details. This is an example of an entangled photon source. And uh, these are our BBM92 uh, schematics. Uh, I mean, this is the actual experimental uh, setup that you see. And uh, what is important in an entanglement based protocol is that your entanglement is quite high, you know, and only then you will have that high security. And so here you can see that we have an entanglement of 0.995, which is as close to one as you can get. And this is a very interesting thing because here you can see that we have measured something, right? Uh, which is the concurrence in this case. And we have, of course, done what is called quantum state tomography. So what is quantum state tomography in a nutshell is, you know, if you similar to it's something like a CT scan of the quantum state. So you have the CT scan, which we are aware of. So let's say the brain, we take different uh, projections of the brain and then we reconstruct the image. Right. And similarly here, we take different projective measurements of the quantum state and reconstruct the state and hence the entanglement. Another way of uh, actually ensuring the security of entanglement based QKD is using what is called a Bell inequality violation. But without getting into the details of that, what is very interesting is that now uh, people have started using, uh, you know, machine learning and reconstructive and you know, this sort of uh, very in, uh, learning based approaches uh, to actually get a better value for the Bell parameter. 
and and now our kind of experiments have actually started using uh, these sort of uh, machine learning based approaches uh, to kind of uh, make the settings of the various um, experimental parameters uh, near perfect which perhaps is not going to work very well uh, by just human intervention and so in fact this is uh, so you know uh, these sort of ideas are actually now coming in uh, to quantum uh, communication as well and similarly of course quantum computing because you know this sort of uh, approaches towards optimization which are not just the straightforward optimization but involves some learning is now uh, starting to play a role and so there is a, a lot of um, uh, effect uh, and impetus uh, you know that uh, these approaches now have even on the technological applications not just in the theoretical ones but even in the technological applications so, so this is something that actually is um, getting affected by learning now i just wanted to spend a couple of minutes in telling you about uh, a very interesting toolkit that we have come up with and this is interesting from two perspectives first of all because you know uh, you know it is a toolkit by which we can actually tell you about what would be the key rate and the cuba by taking into account the imperfections that an experiment would have okay and so the problem is that uh, you know and in fact it caught a lot of uh, public attention and media attention and 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 uh, you know uh, led to a lot of discussion uh, after it was uh, published and 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 so while there are different simulation toolkits which do exist for qkd in literature what does not exist is a toolkit which takes into account the fact that an experiment is an experiment so usually what happens is that these sort of toolkits are prepared by uh, software um, based software engineers you know that background people so they don't really worry about the fact that my beam splitter is not going to be a 50 51 really or my detection is not going to be perfect and so because we, when we started doing this we realized this doesn't exist so we de decided to develop it ourselves and that is what led to the development of qkd sim which is a, a simulation toolkit which actually takes into account these things and so you can use it then to kind of come up with a good understanding of how the experiment should be you know so it's almost like you know you can um, figure out much better as to how you should do your experiment before doing it and so if you did it and then figured it out then you would have already spent those resources and so it's not very cost effective and that is why it helps in quick accommodation of all these uh, various um, you know realistic imperfection experimental non idealities and physical process models and 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 gives us a very nice performance and what is also very interesting is that we have used this agivol uh, model for software development which i am told is a thoughtworks um, uh, invention and so we have actually used the waterfall model for some of our stuff and then brought in agility through the agile platform and so this is an example of the agifall model uh, being used in uh, quantum key distribution and so uh, i mean you know without going into detail so these are all the various things which get fed into the various uh, uh, modules of this architecture and so uh, that is what uh, we have developed a modular architecture uh, which is very important because if i now today want to simulate some other protocol all i need to do is replace a certain module with something else rather than simulate the whole thing bottom up and that modular architecture thus uh, is very helpful we have also done a lot of bootstrapping analysis and included that also in this uh, qk simulation toolkit and and giving us very nice optimized results which uh, are here so i go over to the results and you can see how the simulation and the experiment compare rather well you know around 50 kilobits per second and of course we have restricted the cuber to be below this information theoretic security threshold and this is something uh, which uh, now we are going into the next iteration um, by including even more imperfections uh so we are self gorsons uh our lab actually is uh, you know focusing on um, uh, doing all these various developments in quantum communications towards uh, developing various techniques for long distance quantum communications and why is that important because of course it's not just me and my student who would like to communicate with each other in the lab through qkd uh, ultimately we want this to be useful for people who are uh, uh, separated from each other by large distances because that is when the security aspect will be even more useful for for instance the defense purposes and 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 many others right and so if you want to do ground based qkd then what you need is line of sight so two parties need to keep seeing each other only then it would be uh, applicable but then beyond a certain uh, distance you cannot see each other because of course the horizon comes in as a problem 
So uh, that is not going to happen. Then you can use fibers, perhaps optical fibers, which is a common way of communication in the classical domain. But then beyond the uh, optical fibers have attenuation, right? So the, the uh, signal drops. So beyond a certain uh, distance, let's say around 300 kilometers, it would have dropped significantly. And so you would need an amplifier or a booster. But you can't do it in the conventional sense in the quantum domain because you will violate the no cloning theorem, which basically tells you that you cannot clone or copy an unknown quantum state. So you have to think out of the box in order to do long distance quantum communication. And there are two approaches people are following. One is what is called a quantum repeater based approach, which is also something we are developing. And then there is something called satellite based quantum key distribution, which is a project that we are working on as well. And so what, what will happen in satellites? Satellite will act as a trusted node. So essentially the idea is that you have two ground stations, which is separated by thousands of kilometers and the satellite comes, spends some time on top of one when it's passing, right? And exchanges a key. Then it goes over to the other one, exchanges a key. And then in, by virtue of doing that, these two ground stations are now linked by a uh, quantum link. And they, they need not have line of sight, nor should they be connected by fibers. And that is the idea of satellite-based QKD. And uh, in fact, there are lots of, uh, you know, um, results which tell you as to how far you can go with different approaches. But the big picture we are looking at is a global quantum communication network where we would have, you know, satellite based QKD. And then, of course, these ground stations would be connected to different service providers through fiber links or even free space links and so on. So and then uh, different satellites would be connected in different countries, giving us uh, a global quantum communication network for our secure uh, you know, exchange of communication. And so uh, our experiment is called Quantum Experiments with Satellite Technology, uh, which is a collaboration of RRI with the Indian Space Research Organization started in 2017. And in fact, uh, that is our plan. So we want to establish information theoretically secure communication between two ground stations in India. And also, uh, in fact, with uh, other countries, including, for instance, we have a plan to have one with Canada, which would be some 13,000 kilometer link and that we are hoping to uh, establish. And so this is our portable ground stations at RRI. So when you visit, you will see that we are doing this free space communication now, which is of course terrestrial, but uh, we will now soon start uh, looking upwards uh, towards space. Um, just pictures. And so this is India's first project on satellite based QKD. And in fact, uh, we're very happy that, you know, we made a lot of progress on this. And so now we are working already on the free space uh, architectures. And other than that, in quantum communications, we are also working on integrated photonics based quantum key distribution. So that this is like the long distance one, as I said, but the, this one is about putting it all on a chip. And, and, you know, maybe it can be inserted into devices which we commonly use. And so this is something maybe has a, has a usage even for uh, uh, common people like you and me. And then uh, we are working on quantum teleportation, which is yet another way of communication where you can teleport the quantum state, but not move the object itself. So this is uh, something that we are working on. And this is also India's first project on quantum teleportation. And another thing we are doing is under this center of excellence in quantum technology we have, we have uh, which is on quantum random number generation. Now that's something very interesting because random numbers, as you know, are uh, necessary in not only in physical systems, but biological systems as well. You are using random numbers in different types of simulations. And so what we are working on is something called device independent random number generation, which would be uh, what is called genuinely random. I won't get into the details of that, but that is a very exciting thing we are currently working on. And so I just wanted to show you a little slide which tells you about how the market is seen to be evolving for QKD systems through dedicated simulations done by, uh, by this company. And you can see that, you know, it's growing. And, and so the projection is that by 20, uh, you know, 28, we would have, uh, you know, uh, an equal uh, participation from the civil and the military. So we can see that this is going to explode and it's going to be used by different kinds of sectors. Uh, so this was the uh, close up of that. So with that, uh, I think I have finished just on time. So thank you very much for your attention and um, yeah, thank you.